few series have remakes that hold as much significance as the Pokemon series. They always bring innovations despite being remakes, and they are eagerly anticipated by fans for years, sometimes even more so than new games, despite being released only every six years. And all of this was initiated by Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, born out of a very specific need from Game Freak. The announcement and quick release surprised everyone, with only a few weeks between the reveal and launch of the games. Despite a discreet promotion, the games had a lightning-fast start, but sales quickly slowed, which may indicate a mixed reception. Moreover, they faced strong criticism from journalists. Some saw it as a game with no reason to exist, offering nothing substantially new, while others considered it an excellent title that enhanced the first generation so much that it became outstanding. As is often the case with Pokemon games, opinions vary widely. But surprisingly, despite being controversial, this game had a significant impact on the Pokemon franchise, and even on Nintendo as a whole. So how did the idea of a Pokemon remake on the Game Boy Advance arise, especially when the console is compatible with Game Boy games? How did Game Freak develop a remake of an iconic first generation? Why did it cause such a division among journalists upon release? And why is it one of the lowest rated Pokemon games? Moreover, how did it influence not only the Pokemon franchise, but also the Nintendo consoles of that era? This is the story and the analysis of Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, the strange remake of the first generation. In the middle of 2002, Game Freak is working on a game tentatively called Pokemon Advance. The development is really complex for several reasons. This is the first Game Boy Advance game developed by the company, and Pokemon Advance is highly ambitious, aiming to harness the full power of the console. And it's just after the global Pokemon craze and the extraordinary phenomenon generated by this new franchise. Many believe Pokemon was merely a passing trend among many others and that it had faded away. In this context, Game Freak develops the game with no idea of how the next installment will be received. The development of the game takes an extensive amount of time due to these factors. Managing the technical legacy of previous games and everything Pokemon Gold and Silver accomplished proves to be the most time-consuming. After grappling with these issues for a considerable time, Game Freak decides to abandon ideas like the day-night cycle present in Pokemon Gold and Silver and they even completely overhaul the data structure of Pokemon, allowing the addition of new data such as natures, IVs and EVs replacing DVs, and even the location and level at which a Pokemon is caught. But the most problematic part is that there is no way to communicate between a Game Boy game and a Game Boy Advance game. Nintendo did not provide any such accessory. And this poses a massive problem because it implies that the new Pokemon games will no longer be compatible with the previous ones. This is a significant issue since, remember, the Pokemon slogan for years during the peak of the phenomenon was precisely, gotta catch them all. Additionally, it condemns the Pokemon already caught, leaving them trapped in previous games forever. The development team faces a tough dilemma. But Game Freak takes the plunge and decides to outright remove the gotta catch em all slogan, breaking compatibility with previous games, even if they know it will generate frustration among the fans. But the early 2000s also marked the time when the Pokemon Company, headed by Sunikazu Ishihara, takes over the Pokemon license. During a discussion between Sunikazu Ishihara, president of the Pokemon Company, and Junichi Masuda, director of Pokemon Advance, now titled Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, an idea quickly emerges. To address the compatibility issue with previous games, they propose remaking the first Pokemon games, Pokemon Red and Green, for the Game Boy Advance, incorporating Pokemon from the first two generations. Sunikazu Ishihara's plan to sustain the Pokemon franchise after the Pokemon craze is having a new anime season every year, a new movie every year a lot of Pokemon spin-offs, and the release of a Pokemon game every year or every two years. Since it's not feasible to create a new Pokemon game every year, remaking Game Boy games which are less extensive and complete than Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire 
would ensure having a game for the following year, along with resolving all the issues. At the same time, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire are released in Japan and worldwide, proving to be yet another enormous success. At a time when everyone thought Pokemon was finished and a thing of the past, when Junichi Masuda was afraid that nobody would care about these new games and that it would jeopardize the studio's finances that invested heavily in them, and when Nintendo produced a relatively limited number of cartridges due to indicators suggesting limited success, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire had a meteoric start. In just a few hours, it went out of stock. Every time it returned to stores, it sold out quickly. Despite stock shortages, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire had the most striking launch for a Game Boy Advance game selling 1.2 million units within a handful of days in Japan. The same was true worldwide. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire demonstrated to everyone that Pokemon was not just a passing trend, but now one of the most popular franchises in the gaming world, here to stay. But inside Game Freak, some employees are getting tired of Pokemon before creating Pokemon. Game Freak created a lot of games for multiple consoles, but now they are stuck with Pokemon and only Pokemon. Ken Sugimori, the art director and the creator of a lot of Pokemon, suggests the idea of a game unrelated to Pokemon on Game Boy Advance. It's been seven years since Game Freak has been locked into Pokemon, with an utterly hectic pace and a franchise that has completely overtaken them. Junichi Masuda then reorganizes the studio with three different teams, one team to handle this new game, which will start development a bit later in early 2004 to help kick off the rest. Another team to work on the complementary version of Ruby and Sapphire, which would become Pokemon Emerald, and another team assigned to the Game Boy Advance remake of the first Pokemon games. Their main directive is to change as little things as possible, partly due to time constraints, since every change can have significant consequences. Moreover, Game Freak believes that the main appeal of the game will be the nostalgia for those who have already played it, and they don't want to detract too much from that aspect. It's a delicate situation for them because fans love the first Pokemon games so much that any change could be poorly received, hence the direction to change as little as possible. Junichi Masuda's goal is to avoid making any change to the game but to add content without altering what already exists. This would justify the remake beyond a graphical refresh. Surprise players have the first Pokemon available while offering a nostalgic experience for those who played it many years ago. It would also provide a new and different gaming experience for those who never played it. As Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire takes a different direction from Pokemon Red and Blue, in order to add some interesting new things, Game Freak try many things, often ending up removing some innovations that alter the game. For example, during development, Game Freak adds a new feature that allows encountering two wild Pokemon at once, and initiating a double battle against both Pokemon simultaneously. However, they eventually remove this functionality, even though it was mostly implemented. They also consider adding many items, as in Ruby and Sapphire, with various uses, but still they fear disrupting the balance of the adventure and prefer to add very few, giving some to wild Pokémon with a low chance of holding them to encourage players to catch them. Junichi Masuda has had an idea for a while that he finds interesting, adding a summary of the game each time the player resumes the game. It's a good idea on this kind of game, but it poses significant problems for the development team. They reportedly ask Masuda to remove it. However, Masuda explains repeatedly that it's crucial for the game and everything it adds, eventually convincing the developers to try again and again until they achieve something acceptable, even though they define it themselves as a feature that can cause many bugs because it requires substantial background work while the player is playing the game. During development, the Pokemon Company takes advantage of the opportunity to ask Ken Sugimori to redesign and update all the Pokemon from the first and second generations, with some changes along the way. For example, the Pokemon Company received several complaints in Japan about the Pokemon Mr. Mime. The reason may seem a bit strange, but it's because of its number of fingers. Mr. Mime has only four fingers, and in Japan, this has several negative connotations such as referencing gang members, because some of them, including the famous Yakuza, often had fingers cut off. So Ken Sugimori redesigns it with five fingers this time, just like Pikachu, which also previously had only four. These are not the only Pokémon to see their number of fingers change, as Haunter, Raticate, Dodrio, and Golem 
go from four fingers to three for similar reasons. And more generally, all Pokémon are redesigned to be much simpler and friendlier. They transition from terrifying monsters which, according to Sugimori himself, represented fierce beasts in the first generation, to Pokémon that smile all the time and seem less dangerous. Pokémon like Charmeleon go from a very aggressive pose to a very calm one. Arcanine and Growlithe go from aggressive barking dogs to big smiles. Additionally, Pokémon that lose some of their attributes, like Cubone, which previously seemed to cry while touching its skull, representing that of its deceased mother, now have a much more conventional pose, but the biggest change is the style from the old artworks that showed Pokémon in motion and attacking in front of us, highlighting their aggressive side. Now they appear immobile. Hypno, which now looks to the side while before it seemed to come towards us, or even more evident with Pokémon like Machamp, Tentacruel, or Jolteon, transitioning from very frightening poses to very standard ones now. But Sugimori drew them that way because now the artworks are used in many Pokémon spin-offs and as promotional materials. While Sugimori was drawing all of the artworks, Junichi Masuda was thinking about how to add content to the game. He thought of something interesting, a new portion of the world added in the form of an archipelago. These islands are based on the Agasawara Archipelago, located southeast of Japan. The archipelago is known for its unique fauna and flora, which evolve differently from those found in Japan and from each other. Game Freaks finds this idea brilliant and is very proud of it, planning initially for at least 24 different islands in the game. However, they are eventually reduced to 9 islands, and then further reduced to only 7 different islands, favoring larger and more expansive islands than the small ones found on the Agasawara Archipelago. As these islands have different environments from Japan, it makes sense for Game Freak to include Johto Pokémon, which are also no longer available in Ruby and Sapphire. Each of the islands is designed differently, and Masuda wants to add a Braille quest, just like Ruby and Sapphire with the Regis, that is quite successful according to him. Players love making the connection with the game manual, which contains the Braille alphabet, deducing the steps of the quest to reach each of them, and this new quest adds a real sense of mystery to the game. Despite these additions, the overall game is extremely similar to Pokémon Red and Blue. The same environments, the same towns, the same routes, the same Pokémon, the same music, the same battles, and this worries a man, the new CEO of Nintendo, Satoru Iwata. The Game Boy Advance quickly gained a bad reputation for being a console that recycles games, with plenty of remasters and remakes like the Super Mario Advance series, Yoshi's Island, Donkey Kong Country, Final Fantasy, Kirby, Zelda, and even the recently announced Metroid Zero Mission. Iwata doesn't like this trend and sees the aging image of Nintendo as one of the problems handicapping the company. He fears that in addition to this, a remake of the extraordinarily popular Pokémon Red and Blue, which are Game Boy games, and Game Boy games are playable on Game Boy Advance, will greatly accentuate this aspect. Furthermore, Satoru Iwata doesn't particularly like remakes and prefers to offer new gaming experiences. So initially, Nintendo will not announce the remakes, even though their release is scheduled for the end of 2003. Imagine just four months before the planned release, the game has not been announced yet. Satoru Iwata will meet Sunikazu Ishihara, the president of the Pokémon Company, whom he knows well, to show him one of the many projects of Nintendo's research and development section that is experimenting with Motorola's wireless technology. It's a small device to plug into the EXT port of the Game Boy Advance, enabling wireless linking with another Game Boy Advance, essentially a wireless link cable. It may seem trivial today, but at that time it was impressive because these technologies were still new. Iwata asked Ishihara to propose this to Game Freak, to add support for it in the Pokémon remakes, to give them a real technical novelty, to give them an image of a game brought up to date and a real reason to play or replay these games that he finds too close to the originals. He is so committed to this idea that he proposes to include the accessory in each of the games without increasing the price. The accessory is relatively expensive to produce, and the games would be much less profitable for Nintendo. Still, for Iwata, it's necessary, even if it means falling out with some high-ranking Nintendo executives who don't understand his choice. Ishihara talks to Game Freak, who gladly agrees to integrate infrared support, but is then forced to delay the release of the game a bit, missing the end of 2003. And as Game Freak tests the accessory, they find that the connection is much simpler, 
faster and smoother than with the link cable. They anticipate that it will greatly simplify event distribution of mythic Pokemon, where until now, one had to sometimes wait in line for a long time to get them. Probably due to the addition of this support, Game Freak decides to integrate a new special area, the Metamo Cave, in the Sevi Islands. This cave only contains Zubats, but the mystery gifts distributed in events will allow players to change Zubats for another second-generation Pokémon, like Mareep, Pineco, Shuckle, Teddy Ursa, Houndour, Pokémon that are challenging to fit into the other islands whose climates are not suitable for their addition in those areas, and will thus be the only way to obtain them. Now that the games will include wireless adapters, Nintendo can finally make the official announcement. During the Tokyo Game Show 2003, on September 26th, Nintendo announces Pokemon Fire Red and Pokemon Leaf Green, not showing any game images but instead focusing on the new accessories that will allow wireless connection. The reactions are mixed. On one hand, these accessories are well received, and the technology is interesting. On the other hand, they are seen as just another rehash of Pokemon Red and Blue, without much interest. Some even question if these versions will be released outside of Japan, as the titles refer to the original games Pokemon Red and Green, released only in Japan, whereas outside of Japan, the names Pokemon Red and Blue were chosen. Nintendo of America confirms fairly quickly that these games should be released outside Japan with the same names. Then comes the question of why choose these titles for the games instead of choosing Pokemon Fire Red and Water Blue, for example. Well, Junichi Masuda himself insisted on keeping the original titles, as he explained. Originally, Pokemon Red and Green became Pokemon Red and Blue outside Japan. So logically, it should have been Pokemon Fire Red and Pokemon Water Blue in the United States. But I really wanted to keep Pokemon Leaf Green for several reasons. The leaf is a symbol of peace. Fire and water repel each other. I wanted to have the bright colors of Bulbasaur on the game cover. The word leaf is easier to understand in countries where the American title will be used. For all these reasons, it became Pokemon Leaf Green. The promotion of the game is underwhelming. A few weeks before its release, only one image of the game has been shown, and Nintendo communicates very little about it, preferring to focus on new games for the console. Interestingly, when they talk about it, they reveal that they have produced only 500,000 units for the game's release in Japan, whereas Ruby and Sapphire had sold 1.2 million copies in a single weekend. Many wonder what is happening. Does Nintendo not believe in the Pokemon remakes, or can they not produce as many cartridges as they want due to the accessory provided with the game, which, as it is expensive to produce, could be a problem for Nintendo? On the other hand, they announced a special edition of the console to accompany the game's release. And even if it is not worth much, since they have made special editions for the Game Boy Advance for a lot of games, it means that its release is still taken somewhat seriously. But as the days pass, Nintendo is providing more information and showing images of the games which looks very convincing. In January 23, 2004, Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green are released in Japan. And once again, it's a huge success. Every unit produced find buyers quickly. Each time the games are back on the shelves, they stay there for only a few hours, which is quite surprising. The Pokemania is not dead. And the fact that remakes of games released not so long ago sell so well makes everyone understand that Pokemon is an extraordinary franchise that cannot die. However, a problem arises for the international release. The games need to be translated, of course, but more importantly, Nintendo cannot produce a lot of wireless adapters at the same time. Therefore, they need to wait for the storm to calm down in Japan before starting the production of the international versions. However, at the same time at E3 2004, Nintendo announces its new portable console, the Nintendo DS, which is scheduled for release at the end of 2004. So they absolutely must release Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green before the Nintendo DS arrives and overshadows them. So at this same E3, Nintendo announces the release of Pokemon Fire Red Leaf Green for September 2004, several weeks before the Nintendo DS. They opened pre-orders in August, and incredibly, the pre-orders for the game were three times higher than those of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. And that's just within three weeks in the United States. While everyone is focused on the upcoming duel between the Nintendo DS and the PlayStation Portable, the game surpasses one million copies in the United States, and quickly in Europe, becoming one of the best-selling games for the console. But the critics are not as enthusiastic about the game. 
Although the scores are generally good, journalists write that the base game is so exceptional that even years later, its formula works extremely well. Therefore, they consider Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green to be enjoyable games, but not offering much new. IGN gives it a score of 9 out of 10, while noting that the game's graphics are very limited and basic. GameSpot notes that they could have added a few changes. Game Informer described the changes as gussy up a corpse to make it more appealing, while giving it a nice 8 out of 10. In Europe, biggest websites give a similar outlook. JeuVideo.com gives it a meager 15 out of 20, explaining that they expected more from these remakes. GameCult explains that the original game is so extraordinary that it is impossible to miss the remake of the game. And before being a marketing phenomenon, Pokemon is an excellent, rich, complex, and complete game. However, they regret not having the Johto content in the game, since both regions were present in Pokemon Gold and Silver. But this leads to a somewhat bizarre situation. How can they give it such glowing scores while pointing out a lack of change? And is there really so little change in the game? There are actually many things that have changed, more than what was originally planned by Game Freak, both in terms of added content with a much longer lifespan and obviously a significant modernization. So why do the critics feel that it's the same game and don't even mention the game's additions in the reviews? Does Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green deserve these excellent scores? Let's find out right away. As soon as the game starts, we're confronted with one of the most perplexing new features of the game, and more importantly, a surprising change in direction. Initially, we're treated to the fantastic animated battle between Gengar and Nidorino. However, what I find truly unfortunate is the absence of the Pokemon scrolling on the title screen, a feature that was present on the Game Boy. This was a clever functionality, never reintroduced, but highly intelligent. It showcased some of the Pokemon available in the game, including their evolutions, motivating players to catch Pokemon and encouraging them to continue. Instead, we now have a basic title screen with just a Venusaur or a Charizard and a few standard visual effects. One might argue that Pokemon are now much more well known than at the original game's release, and showing them here would have less impact. However, you'll see that it could have made sense because Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green seem to cater more to new players than to veterans. Upon starting a new game, we are immediately faced with the most perplexing new features I mentioned. The game offers a useless tutorial on the controls, stating, for example, that the directional arrows are used to move the character or that the A button is used to confirm a choice or speak in the game. This is followed by a tutorial on the game, explaining that we play as the main character who sets out to explore the world of Pokémon. None of this makes any sense, especially with numerous help pages available at any time by pressing the L or R buttons. Even after skipping this help, there is another introductory text page that explains the game. This seems really useless. Even if it were designed for very young children, either they cannot read yet, making it useless, or they won't bother reading all of it. This also makes no sense because this was already planned in the original game, because right after, Professor Oak explains the basics of the Pokémon world in a much simpler, shorter, and more dynamic way, without breaking immersion with text pages. Unfortunately, it's representative of a part of the game that guides the player too much for everything. For instance, there is text and interventions from Professor Oak during the first battle against our rival to explain what a Pokémon battle is. However, this also makes no sense since this first battle is already a tutorial itself, intentionally slow, with only normal moves, one dealing damage, and another one that lowers the opponent's stats. 
It shows the player the two main types of moves, direct damage moves and moves that allow better positioning in battle. What was clever was that it allowed the player to learn all this naturally, without text, thus favoring immersion and leaving the player experienced enough to discover it all independently. This is also the case with the beginning of the game. Unlike Red and Blue, the player is given Pokeballs without having to buy them. This is a bit strange because as we return Professor Oak's parcel after retrieving it from the shop, we would want to go back to the shop since we have just done an errand for the shopkeeper. There we realize we can buy Pokeballs and other useful items, being an intelligent tutorial for the shops of the game. Here we already have balls, so we can catch Pokemon, but after giving the player Pokeballs and them already having caught Pokemon, the game also forces them to go through the Pokemon catching tutorial, which was optional in Red and Blue. This disrupts the flow for no real reason. Given that the majority of players already know the Pokemon, and the others will have plenty of time to discover them. But then, why add all of this? Game Freak created these games just a few years ago. They should be aware of all this. There is already a great and natural tutorial in the game, covering battles, types, exploration, and discovering the game. Adding an extra layer and significantly weighing down the early part of the game seems to be a vision that doesn't make sense, especially considering that these games were the first for many players and are still the best selling in the series today. So, if the beginning of the game or understanding the Pokemon world were a real problem, they would never have sold so well. Well, Game Freak did indeed develop these games a few years earlier, but the person who designed a large part of the game, which is the only person credited as the game designer of the first games, isn't really working on the Pokemon games anymore. The enigmatic creator of Pokemon, Satoshi Tajiri, has disappeared. Even if Sunikazu Ishihara responds in interviews that Tajiri supervised the project and gave his approval, it doesn't seem to be the case. Besides his role as CEO of Game Freak, he doesn't appear to be directly involved in Pokemon games anymore. Not only did the vision of Pokemon take a turn from Generation 3 onwards, but he's also not directly credited in the game, whether as a game designer, producer, director, or even supervisor. Satoshi Tajiri is only mentioned in the scenario, which seems to refer to the original game's plot, or as an executive director, referring to his role as CEO of Game Freak, where Satoru Iwata, Nintendo's CEO, and Sunikazu Ishihara, CEO of the Pokemon Company, are also credited in the same role, and his absence might explain why a new direction was given to this early part of the game. Because this vision of simplifying the early part of the game continues, as we quickly regain the Tichi TV, once again an item that gives lessons to the player on how to battle, even though we've just battled our rival, or how to catch Pokemon when we've already had the mandatory tutorial showing us how to catch Pokemon, and it's the person who just taught us giving us the item. It's ridiculous, and it doesn't stop. It's like this throughout the early part of the game, with changes that I would even call destructive. For example, the potion in Pewter City, which was hidden in a bush in red and blue, is now in plain sight in fire red and leaf green. This is a significant problem because in red and blue, this potion was hidden with a single bush amidst the rocks. Naturally, it attracted attention and the player would want to interact with it, finding a useful item. It showed the player that exploration is rewarded, encouraged them to keep their eyes open and drew attention to these bushes, which would later need to be cut with cut. It's a shame to break this aspect that was important. And more generally, Pokemon Red and Blue does an excellent job of training the player naturally with the tutorial battle against the rival, with the first Pokemon we encounter like Pidgey, which inevitably deals damage to us since it only has Gust and leads us to discover the Pokemon Center on our own. The hidden potion I just mentioned, the Viridian Forest full of Weedle, that poisons but the game provides antidotes, forcing the player to learn to use items. The bug Pokemon available in Viridian Forest that evolve quickly, showing the principle of evolution to the player. If Pokemon Red and Blue has been so successful worldwide, creating a Pokemon craze, it's precisely because it allows every player to go through the adventure while transparently training them, without breaks, without plain and silly text, and favoring immersion. This is less the case with Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, with an additional absurdity not receiving the running shoes before defeating the first gym. This means that for the first few hours of the game, the character moves extremely slow, as the world has been redesigned on a larger scale. We move faster on Game Boy, so this beginning is strange, even though the foundation of the game is still quite solid and some of the changes are greatly appreciated. 
For example, explaining clearly to the player that the choice of the starter Pokémon defines the game's difficulty, as Professor Oak indicates. Bulbasaur is very easy to raise and represents the game's easy difficulty. It evolves faster than the others in its final form and has an advantage against the first four gyms, which can be difficult for the others. He then indicates that Squirtle is just worth raising since it has an advantage against the first gym, but a disadvantage against the next three. And Charmander requires more patience than the others since the first two gyms will be very difficult with it, and it has a type disadvantage. However, this is somewhat relative since in this remake, Charmander learns a new move at level 13, Metal Claw, which is super effective against the Rock-type Pokémon of the first gym. Additionally, you can now find a Mankey early in the game, which is also very useful against Brock, and that wasn't the case in Pokémon Red and Blue, only in Pokémon Yellow. So Charmander becomes much less challenging to start with. I even think that following these changes, Squirtle is the most difficult to start with, as the second, third, and fourth gyms are tricky with it. But all of this isn't really important since Pokémon is a game that encourages you to catch other Pokémon to put in your team, and conveniently they are intelligently placed to help against the gyms. You find Grass-type Pokémon next to Cerulean City, which helps against Misty's Water-type Pokémon, Diglett and Dugtrio next to Vermilion City, which helps against Surge's Electric-type Pokémon, and Fire and Flying-type Pokémon next to Celadon City, which helps against Erika's Grass-type Pokémon. And it's the same thing throughout the entire game, so in the end, it's quite a welcome change, especially since it's there to streamline progression, a significant focus of this remake. Despite the slow movement in the first hour of the game, we later obtain running shoes, and it's a great pleasure to move around. Like in Ruby and Sapphire, the running shoes are excellent for adding pace to exploration. You can easily backtrack with these running shoes, and with the game running smoothly at 60 FPS, it's a real delight to stroll and traverse all these environments. Moreover, Game Freak added the ability to run in various environments. In Generation 3, you couldn't run indoors, but here you can run in rocket hideouts and in caves, making it easier to explore. And it goes beyond just the running shoes. A lot of things are easier, as mentioned before. Charmander learns Metal Claw. There are Mankey and both Nidoran we can catch early on learn Double Kick very early, making it easier to deal with Brock. You could still defeat Brock with Charmander. It was just a bit more challenging, and now it's made much easier. And the same goes for some of the trainers, often with lower levels, like at Nugget Bridge, allowing for an easier progression. The Pokémon they used are more varied too. For example, the gambler outside Lavender Town had two Growlithe in red and blue. Now he has a Growlithe and a Vulpix. You can also heal directly in your room on the SS Anne. While in red and blue, you had to go out, return to the Pokémon Center in Vermilion City, and then come back. Movement is much faster on the conveyor belts found in Team Rocket hideouts. The famous Team Rocket grunt who hides the elevator key in the Celadon City game corner drops it after you defeat him. While in red and blue, you had to talk to him again, fixes what, for me, is one of the biggest flaws of the original game. All this makes the adventure offered by the game smoother and more enjoyable. It also addresses another major flaw that significantly hinders exploration and progression, the lack of ergonomics. In red and blue, it's unbearable to have such a small inventory. You're constantly having to throw away items to pick up others and spending hours storing everything in the PC. This was done on purpose to force players to use TMs and make use of their items, but the inventory was way too small since there are mandatory items that take precious slots. Here we have a huge bag with different pockets that allow for exploration without worrying about all that, and that's even more necessary since you can find way more items in this remake. But for some reason, instead of having one pocket for TMs and another for berries as in Gold and Silver and Ruby and Sapphire, we have a TM case and a berry pouch. So you have to go through this item every time to access TMs, and the same goes for berries. It's a bit silly not to have done the same as in previous games, which were more ergonomic in this regard. But for everything else, the changes done are really good, with the ability to use HMs without going through the menu, pressing select to use a rare item like the bicycle without going through the menu, as well buying casino coins in increments of 500, the ability to fly in all Pokémon centers, even those outside cities, an experience bar showing when your Pokémon will level up, and so on. There are many changes that add a lot of fluidity to progression throughout the adventure, and indirectly encourage exploration. 
Game Freak has also added hidden items, like a rare candy above Cerulean City, made many previously invisible items visible, making the game much more generous and added many items everywhere in the dead ends of the game, like in caves, where every dead end in the rock tunnel leading to Lavender Town is rewarded with lots of items. In Pokemon Red and Blue, caves play a crucial role in being oppressive, slowing down the adventure, annoying the player, and giving them a feeling of suffocation, frustration when going through them with dead ends, trainers everywhere, wild Pokemon that harass us, which are very unsettling and are even defined as vampires by the game itself. And this is not the same in the remake. So the question is, why put such a frustrating area in a video game? Well, because an adventure is successful if it manages to evoke all kinds of emotions throughout the game. And frustration or annoyance are emotions that are important. They allow us to better feel the feelings of freedom, exploration, the sentiment to live a great adventure because we go from suffocating zones with harassing Pokemon to very open areas without wild Pokemon. Naturally, the contrast is striking, and that's what makes the adventure so great and it amplifies the emotions we feel. Unfortunately, these caves have changed a lot and partly lose their interest. Firstly, unlike Pokemon Red and Blue, here you can buy repels to pass through Mount Moon without encountering wild Pokemon, as the shop in Pewter City sells repels, which was not the case before. This is a first issue, because this cave, in addition to playing the role I just mentioned, inducing frustration, etc., also introduces the concept of rare Pokemon in areas. Mount Moon is full of Zubats, but also has rare chances to encounter Paras, Geodude, and especially Clefairy, which is very rare and can become very strong quickly, as you can evolve it immediately with the Moonstones obtained in the same Mount Moon. If you allow the player to use repels to pass through this cave without encountering Pokemon, it loses its reason for existence. For the second cave, which can be passed with repels and therefore no longer has the principle of harassing Pokemon, this cave has many dead ends and trainers who see us from a distance and then harass us. This is also no longer the case here since the trainers are easier to avoid and the dead ends aren't really dead ends anymore thanks to the items that reward exploration. Moreover, the encounter rate of wild Pokemon in these caves has been reduced, which goes in the wrong direction that I am pointing out. These changes make progress in the adventure more fluid and faster, but they make this adventure blander and more monotonous because you are much less slowed down and bothered by all this. Nevertheless, Game Freak has not touched the Team Rocket hideouts, which are also moments in the game where the adventure calms down and stalls a bit. They left annoying trainers everywhere, and that's a very good thing, even if it didn't please everyone. It shows that they knew what they were doing and didn't simplify everything blindly. Some would have liked them to streamline these phases because they complain about the low levels of rocket grunts and the repetition of Pokemon for many of them. But what many people find it hard to understand is that in Pokemon, and even more so in this Pokemon, not all trainers are meant to be faced. They are also obstacles that can be avoided, and they are there to annoy. That's why in these rocket hideouts, they have weak Pokemon that give very little experience. That's why they have the same Pokemon again and again, and that's why these trainers give very little money. There is therefore no reason to face them if you manage to avoid them, but the game still rewards the player if they face them with very specific indications that will help them finish as quickly as possible. It's an excellent balance that has been found and cleverly retained in this remake. There is another very interesting change, that of Moltres, which has been moved from Victory Road to the back of the Island One. It's a very smart change for the game's lore since it ends up at the top of a volcanic area, which corresponds to the Pokémon's origin rather than Victory Road, where it was placed in the original game, and which was apparently placed here because the game's insufficient memory prevented them from adding a volcanic area per se. That's why Cinnabar Island is referred to as having a volcano on some of the guides and artworks even though you don't see one in the game. In the end, it was a blessing in disguise because Moltres' presence on Victory Road, just a detour away, allowed players to discover the legendary Pokémon if they hadn't already done so via the optional power plant and Seafoam Islands, since Victory Road is mandatory in the game. Changing its location to the back of one island, which is also optional, is a slightly different vision that is perfectly defensible and gives this legendary Pokémon a little more depth and rarity. And the other changes made to the progression and flow of the game were made to prevent what is called sequence breaking, 
passing entire portions of the game under certain conditions. For example, you could exchange a Pokemon with Cut with a friend and thus completely skip a part of the game by leaving Cerulean City with Cut. Here, an NPC has been placed in front of the bush to prevent this. You could also give a Poke Doll to the Ghost of Marowak in Pokemon Tower to escape the battle, which caused the game to glitch and consider the battle as done, allowing to skip a significant part of the game with the Rocket Game Corner and the battle against Giovanni, which is no longer possible here. The latest addition is the Tea in Celadon City, which you have to give to a guard in Saffron City to let you enter the city. In Pokemon Red and Blue, you could give him any drink you found in the department store, but as you can now give items to Pokemon and trade them, Game Freak didn't want you to give a fresh water to a Pokemon and trade it to another cartridge, which would have allowed you to enter Saffron City extremely early. So they added tea to be obtained in the Celadon Mansion directly in Celadon City. I've always wondered if it would have been bad to leave them in the game, to let players who know these little Easter eggs enjoy them, to make it easier to replay the game to get other Pokemon like the other starters or the other fossil needed to complete the Pokedex, even if I understand perfectly why it was touched up and that there was no miracle solution here. But what's weird is that if you exchange a Pokemon with Cut and therefore avoid doing the SSN to come back later with a Pokemon that has Surf, you can find the Easter egg of the famous truck, which they left as it is, encouraging players to sequence break Cut as it can only be seen at this by not triggering the SS departure. But all of this is minor compared to what has changed the most in the entire game, the battles, which represent a significant part of the gameplay. Firstly, the AI is much better, addressing one of the major flaws of the original game, where it was challenging to have a competent AI on a Game Boy game with such deep and varied battles. The remake excels in this aspect, starting with our rival, who is quite adept and makes intelligent switches, such as switching Squirtle against Charmeleon. Overall, opposing trainers have better equipped Pokémon with more interesting moves, made possible by the fact that Pokémon now learn more moves naturally. Some Pokémon now learn twice as many moves as before. For example, Paris, which used to learn only four moves, now learns eight. This holds true for many Pokémon that previously had limited move options, such as Krabby, now learns five moves. Gyarados, formerly four moves or even Rhyhorn, previously learned only three moves. The distribution of moves is now much better, with a variety of attacks of different types, providing more freedom in choosing Pokémon throughout the adventure. In addition to natural moves learned by leveling up, Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green introduce a significant new feature called Move Tutors. While this concept was already present in Pokémon Crystal, where there was only one Move Tutor who required casino coins, here they are free to use, but can only be used once. There are many useful moves to learn this way, such as Rock Slide early in the game, Seismic Toss, Mimic, Metronome, or even Ultimate Elemental Attacks like Hydro Cannon. These moves are scattered throughout the adventure, requiring players to find and talk to specific NPCs to unlock these new moves. It rewards exploration and investment in the game, and adds variety to battles, making them more dynamic. This is not the only addition. Abilities have been introduced since Pokémon Ruby and Sapphire. Now all Pokémon have abilities, adding depth to the game, although many of them are repetitive. The starter Pokémon in particular has an ability that makes the adventure a bit easier. When it has low HP, its water, fire, or grass-type moves are boosted. It is delightful to discover these special abilities of numerous Pokémon, breaking the monotony of battles and significantly altering some Pokémon, like the Ghastly family which no longer fears ground-type attacks thanks to Levitate or the Diglett family that traps our Pokémon, preventing them from escaping or being recalled. There's even a level 29 Dugtrio, much stronger than our Pokémon, trapping us at the same location. It's a welcome change to the battle dynamics, but unfortunately, some changes are less appreciated. One minor drawback is the scarcity of double battles in the game, with only a handful present. At the time, Game Freak was afraid that double battles might be poorly received, and they did not take the time to add more in Fire Red and Leaf Green. This contrasts with Pokémon Emerald, where double battles are prevalent, and players enjoyed them. The issue is not necessarily the scarcity, it is more that Pokémon learn many moves that are only useful in double battles, such as Geodude learning Mudsport or Clefairy learning Follow Me. Since there are so few double battles in the game, these moves are unfortunately rendered useless in solo play. Moreover, it's regrettable that they did not take the time to correct all the moves that are of no interest, 
extremely weak moves like leech life, poison gas, or constrict that are never used because they have no strategic value. It would have been nice to rework them, especially since some gym leaders like Surge and Erika use Pokemon with these moves. In the same vein, it's disappointing that so many changes have been made to the available TMs to make them much weaker. The TM dig that you obtain during the adventure is much weaker than in the original game. The TM that Surge gives us after defeating him has been changed from Thunderbolt, which had a power of 95, to Shockwave, which only has a power of 60. The girl on the top floor of the Celadon department store used to give Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Tri-Attack in exchange for different drinks, but now it has been changed to Light Screen, Protect, and Safeguard, much less interesting moves, especially during the adventure. However, it must be acknowledged that some changes are more intelligent, such as finding Bullet Seed just before battling Misty, or the increased diversity of types represented in TMs, including new types like Dark with Snatch or Steel with Iron Tail. Yes, because that's another significant change in battles compared to the original game, the addition of two new types, Steel and Dark. Surprisingly, these types are almost non-existent in the game. Only Magnemite and Magneton bring the novelty of the Steel type, but they are impossible to catch before the last part of the game, and you encounter very few of them. I understand that these types were not present in the original game, but remember that these types were introduced precisely because the type chart in the first generation was unbalanced. However, other changes were made concerning the type chart. For example, in Generation 1, Psychic Pokémon were extremely powerful because there were almost no Bug-type moves to counter them, and they were immune to Ghost-type moves. However, in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, the Psychic type is weak to Ghost-type moves, and the addition of strong Ghost-type moves like Shadow Ball before Sabrina's Gym significantly improves this matter. Moreover, Bug-type moves like Megahorn, which can be learned by Pokémon obtained early in the game, like Nidoking, have been added along with Dark-type moves like Bite and Crunch, which can also help. But the problem is this completely changes the principle of Sabrina's Psychic-type gym, which is deliberately difficult and without weaknesses, and that's why we could do this gym whenever we wanted. Consequently, Sabrina's gym is much less challenging, but unfortunately, this is the case for all gyms. The gyms were a tremendous strength of Pokémon Red and Blue. They allowed players to learn the type matchup seamlessly, encouraged players to catch diverse Pokémon, introduced various challenges with small puzzles, characterized the cities, and showcased the depth of the battle system with many different strategies. These were brilliant ideas that served multiple purposes. However, in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, the gyms have been altered and are much less interesting. Firstly, it's regrettable that the gyms haven't really changed. They are exactly the same in terms of structure. Aside from very slight changes, such as adjusting the Pokémon of some trainers to better match their types, the gyms feature the same puzzles to reach the gym leader. Even the quiz questions to reach Blaine remain unchanged, although they did correct the question that posed a bit of a problem with Caterpie. It's a little bit disappointing that everything is essentially the same because once you've completed the gyms, the puzzles become extremely easy, and the trial aspect they were supposed to highlight loses its significance. This turns them into just battles, whereas they were intended to be much more than that. This is intelligently addressed in Pokémon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which feature entirely new gyms even though they are remakes. In addition to having the same content, the other issue with the gyms is that the battles against the gym leaders are much less interesting. For reasons unknown, the changes made in Pokémon Yellow were not retained. In Pokémon Yellow, the teams of the gym leaders changed, and the levels of the gym leaders' Pokémon were higher. For instance, Giovanni had Pokémon that were 8 levels higher than in the original games. More importantly, the battles have been changed and lose a lot of depth. The gym leaders were supposed to showcase different facets of the game's deep battle system. Brock, in red and blue, showcased to the player an interesting strategy involving Bide which absorbs damage for several turns and then returns it all at once. However, this has been changed to nothing in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green. Brock no longer has a clear strategy and just mindlessly attacks, even though he briefly shows Bind, which traps opponents, and Rock Tomb, which lowers speed. Misty had a strategy based on boosting her defense using Withdraw to make it challenging to defeat her with just a starter Pokémon and encourage players to catch nearby Grass-type Pokémon. However, in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, her only strategy is to heal, and since she doesn't have the defense boost like in the original, players can easily force their way through. 
Those who fare better are the ones whose strategy hasn't really changed, like Surge with Thunder Wave, and now Double Team or Koga with Toxic and Smokescreen. But for some of them, their strategies are no longer relevant. Erika had a strategy based on trapping Pokémon after poisoning them in red and blue, which prevented Pokémon from attacking for several turns while taking poison damage. But the mechanic changed from the second generation onwards, and it no longer prevents trap Pokémon from attacking. Consequently, Erika doesn't have much of a strategy other than spamming status moves, which is not particularly effective as she can't deal much damage. More importantly, there is Sabrina who had a strategy based on using Barrier to raise her defense, coupled with Recover to heal. Now it's more of a strategy based on Calm Mind, making the battle simpler, even though Mr. Mime can pass a defense boost to other Pokémon through Light Screen and then Baton Pass. Giovanni's Raiden has been replaced by a poor Rhyhorn. It's a shame it really deserved more attention to respect what the original game tried to do. The battle system has become even deeper in the meantime, allowing for even better strategies. For example, Blaine could have used a sunny day strategy to introduce players to weather effects, and Erica could have added substitute to her Pokémon to also introduce that concept to the player with status effects. It's a shame to have half of the gym leaders that don't serve much purpose, even though they are well introduced in this game such as Blue's Alakazam encountered just before the Psychic Gym and prepares players for Sabrina's Gym. The Elite Four, on the other hand, is way more convincing with teams close to the original games and various different strategies. For example, the Slowbro with Yawn and Amnesia that puts a Pokémon to sleep to boost itself comfortably, Hitmonchan with Counter that reflects damage, Gengar using Hypnosis and Nightmare to take away life each turn, Additionally, the berries and healing items they now use make the battles really challenging. Unfortunately, the champion, Peter, is the weakest of all because he relies on Hyper Beam, which used to be a really powerful move in the first generation since it didn't require a recharge turn after KOing a Pokémon. However, it no longer works that way, and Peter still has this strategy with some Pokémon having Outrage. Unfortunately, Outrage is a Dragon-type move and Dragon-type moves in the first four generations are special moves, and Pokémon using Outrage don't have a high special attack. So it's not great, and it somewhat deflates the tension, especially after these excellent members of the Elite Four who also have very good AI. For instance, Aldo sends out Onix to encounter Raichu, which is something we really didn't see in the original game. The final battle is against Blue, and again, it's an excellent battle with very strong Pokémon, each with its strategy and a great AI. These battles are excellent with well-balanced difficulty, providing a thrilling conclusion to the adventure and helping to compensate for the less interesting gym battles. And this well-refined AI also enhances immersion because quite often the opposing trainers behave like real trainers. And that's one of the biggest successes of this remake, making the world of Pokémon a credible world to facilitate immersion. Adding the option to play as a female character makes it easier for women to identify with the game. And the sprites of Leaf and Red, the characters we play, and Blue, our rival, are excellent. They appear more mature, resembling young adults rather than children. This makes it more appealing to embody and identify with them than with the somewhat silly-looking children found in later games or on the covers of previous ones. This is to directly enhance immersion but there are also many efforts to make the world much more vibrant. There are plenty of NPCs added compared to Red and Blue, giving more credibility to this universe. For example, in Mount Moon, an NPC is added, stating that they are searching for fossils, making it more believable to find fossils later in the cave. Other NPCs add background information to gym leaders, like an NPC mentioning that Misty trains at the Seafoam Islands. There's also a scientist who laments having his Sylph scope stolen, which, as we will discover a bit later, was snatched by Giovanni. The dialogues around this item have changed to highlight this, just like the lines of the Team Rocket grunts around him. And there is the same for many characters in the game, an excellent idea that adds more naturalness and logic to the game's progression, making its universe more coherent. In this regard, trainers have also undergone quite a few changes, as mentioned earlier, their Pokémon have been modified, but more importantly, they are much more mobile and move more naturally. For example, bikers now circle around Celadon City or on the cycling road, a great idea that makes you wish more trainers had become less static. 
Furthermore, as you progress in the game, trainers use items more often. The Victory Road trainers, for instance, regularly use hyper potions to heal themselves, just like a real trainer would. Some trainers exhibit specific behaviors, like the one who confronts us when we enter his cabin on the SS Anne, contributing to making this world more coherent. Their trainer class is also easier to identify. The gentlemen, sailors, mechanics, etc., who have specific Pokémon and can be recognized before the battle starts. This allows you to organize our team accordingly before launching the battle, using a water-type Pokémon when you know you're going to face a hiker. However, the game sets traps at times, like some mechanics near Vermilion City who don't have electric-type Pokémon. This occasionally surprises the player, breaking the monotony of the battles, and in Fire, Red, and Leaf Green, opposite trainers are moving and spinning towards the players, making them harder to avoid, and they can still see us even after passing them. But because immersion and the illusion of a living world are much more pronounced here, Game Freak has added many small innovations in this direction. The first is the Memory Decks, an item obtained in Cerulean City that records everything said about important characters in the game. Their description, connections with other characters, appearance, rumors, favorite Pokémon, and even their birthplace. On the one hand, it may seem strange that this improves immersion since it's a game mechanic that reminds us we're playing a game, but on the other hand, it's done very elegantly with an item justified in the game's universe. It gives a true identity to the game's characters, with a wealth of information about them and their connections, showcasing how well-constructed the world is and adding once again a layer of credibility. The other significant addition is the fan club in Saffron City, a place where we expand our fan base by earning more and more badges. It's an interesting concept because it makes us realize that our exploits are increasingly recognized, truly giving the impression that the accomplishments we achieve are acknowledged in this world. But of course, the most notable changes are the graphical ones. When we compare the original games with the remakes, they are much prettier graphically. The environments are very well designed and are much more beautiful. For example, there are many different types of trees in the game, whereas in the original, it was the same one repeated. The water looks much more natural and appealing. The power plant looks more like a real power plant with reactors and transformers on the road. We can recognize Mewtwo statues in the mansion that serve as an abandoned laboratory. The museum and its fossils seem more realistic, as does the boat. The gems are much better crafted and are visually distinct from each other. This remake does an excellent job of better characterizing all these places, extremely rich in detail, reinforcing the sense of adventure with beautiful illustrations when entering these places. An excellent idea that makes every place we visit more natural and realistic. And it's the same in battles. We've taken on a new dimension thanks to the battle animation based on where it is initiated. The battle backgrounds of different colors depending on the room, and these new mostly splendid sprites. Although some of them are a bit strange, like the one for Lugia, and they are a bit too static and harmless, as they are based on the artworks I mentioned earlier. But the most significant evolution is in the back sprites, the sprites from the back of our Pokémon, which are much better compared to those in red and blue where sometimes it turned into pixel mush. Here, as they are much more recognizable and more attractive, it reinforces the feeling of being behind our Pokémon and the bond that unites us with them. The slight disappointment comes from the attack animations, which are pretty but less striking than before. It used to be a bit exaggerated in a good way, for example. Look at the difference between Hyper Beam in red and blue Hyper Beam in Fire Red and Leaf Green. It's a bit of a shame not to have stayed in that spirit, but in a way, it's understandable since all these animations were made for Ruby and Sapphire, which has a different spirit from the previous games. Importing them into this game naturally doesn't fit as well with the original game, but most of them are extremely good and makes the battles more enjoyable. The other graphical aspect that has been extensively reworked for this remake is the staging and Game Freak went all out. Lots of things have been added, and there are plenty of brilliant ideas. When you pick up the game again, there's a journal that recounts what happened in your last session. It's a great idea because for a portable console game, sessions can be so fragmented that it's sometimes difficult to remember what happened before. Unfortunately, even though the idea is good, the execution is not great, and the reminders provided are ultimately quite useless. The Pokémon caught, 
the items recovered, what's stored in the PC. These are not important pieces of information to understand where the storyline is. Perhaps that's why we'll never see these kinds of features in subsequent games, outside of the optional journal in Diamond and Pearl. On the other hand, throughout the game, there are many other aspects that are much more successful. First, there's the color of the text that changes, red when talking to a woman, blue when talking to a man, gray when it's indicative text from the game. This cleverly separates the game text from the dialogues, but strangely, it has never been adopted in later games. There are also the items we use on our Pokémon, which trigger a little scene with our Pokémon facing us and the item being used on it. Something similar happens with TMs, where we use a disc to teach the chosen move to our Pokémon. This staging helps to anchor the game in our universe, making things less magical and more logical while strengthening the bond with our Pokémon. For the same reasons, many visual effects have been reworked, such as Leo's teleportation to his house in Cerulean City which gets a more elaborate cinematic than in Red and Blue. The staging of the Elite Four is also much more convincing with these super colorful rooms, although less wild than in Red and Blue, where we battled Olga on ice, Aldo amidst rocks, and Agatha amid graves. Here the rooms are beautiful but lack the crazy and exaggerated aspect of Red and Blue, reinforcing realism since these rooms are perfectly logical, and Peter's room is magnificent with dragon fangs around much better than the room filled with Pokémon statues in red and blue. And the staging doesn't end with the adventure, since even after finishing it, during the end credits, the game takes us through the entire world of Kanto, different routes, cities, and places visited. This makes us realize the entire adventure we've just experienced, everything we've covered, a feeling of immense pride and accomplishment, all accompanied by a medley of the most iconic game music. It's a true evolution compared to the limited original game text on the Game Boy. The same goes for the Pokédex, which underwent a significant evolution, being more ergonomic in navigation, more complete with the regional and national Pokédex, the ability to explore Pokémon by zone, search alphabetically by type or even by weight. The descriptions have also been touched up. It's pleasant to use during the adventure, doing what we ask while remaining very simple. It leads to a nice little scene after catching a Pokémon, and they took the time to create different descriptions between Fire Red and Leaf Green without borrowing from Ruby and Sapphire, an effort to applaud even if most definitions were taken from Red and Blue. But there are more discrete staging ideas that are just as excellent, like footprints in the sand, bikers circling around people to scare them, or even after healing the captain of the SS Anne, hearing the ship's whistle as a sign that the ship is about to leave. These are small details, but details that demonstrate that a lot of attention and a desire to improve a great quality of the original game, making the world credible. Unfortunately, these efforts were not put into other aspects of the game that deserved it. In fact, Game Freak made a remake extremely close to the original games and probably too close. I mentioned the gyms that haven't changed, but this criticism can be applied to many things in the game especially considering that in the meantime, Gold and Silver and then Ruby and Sapphire brought many interesting novelties. For example, in Ruby and Sapphire, what impresses are the visual effects, like the sand blowing in the desert, rain falling on some routes, puddles on the path with different sounds, water reflecting clouds, and the reflection of our character on the water. Even the drought effect after Groudon's appearance all of it makes the adventure in Hoenn enjoyable, breaking monotony while allowing for impressive locations. Unfortunately, there's none of that here because it didn't exist in Kanto. Still, it would have been great to add, especially since environments like the islands have been added, and even on the islands, these visual effects are almost non-existent. It was done on rare occasions, like the Pokémon Tower, which adopts the fog effect already present in the Mount Pyre of Ruby and Sapphire. The same goes for the bicycle, which has been reused and is exactly the same as in Pokémon Red and Blue, obtained in the same way. However, the world is larger in Fire Red and Leaf Green, since it recreates Kanto, but on a larger scale, making the bike move slower, or at least it seems to move slower. Frankly, most of the time, running shoes seem to go almost as fast, especially when using it after playing Pokémon Ruby and Sapphire, which had two bikes. The Mach bike for super-fast travel, and the Arco bike for stunts and navigating tight spaces. 
Using the simple bicycle in fire red and leaf green right after makes one feel frustrated about how limited it is compared to the others. It's even more disappointing because in this game, you have to go back and forth between Vermilion City and Cerulean City to get it, while in Ruby and Sapphire, they're given right away. Also, as it's a basic bicycle, there are no gameplay additions like the collapsing floors of the Sky Pillar, sand slopes, or the rocks and platforms that showcase the qualities of the two bikes. Unfortunately, it feels like a step backward, and more importantly, a missed opportunity, as once again, given all the shared features between these games, it seems it wouldn't have required a tremendous effort. The same goes for contests. In Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, Game Freak added contests of different categories, where you compete with other Pokemon in front of a jury. Some may find these contests uninteresting, but they are essential because they add another layer of interest to Pokemon, aligning with what the first generation offered. Pokemon aren't just battle tools, they are companions helping us navigate the world, hence the idea of adding TMs to teach our Pokemon moves that help us overcome obstacles. Contests were another good idea to give them more utility outside of battles, and to potentially make all Pokemon useful, even those kept in our PC that aren't very strong in battles, as only the moves matter. The same goes for the case of the EXP Share. In Generation 1, to get the EXP Share, you go to Celadon City and need to have caught 50 different Pokemon. So the item is far into the game, usually for post-game use. In Ruby and Sapphire, it was reintroduced early in the game with its mechanics modified, making it available for easier integration of caught Pokemon into the team by giving them levels without making them battle. In Fire, Red, and Leaf Green, it's not possible to do this before the end of the adventure, which is a bit of a letdown. What's disappointing is not that it's done this way, but rather that there's no real continuity with Ruby and Sapphire. And from one game to another, the visions are different, even if in the end it's not that important. But in fact, all these changes that we might have hoped for, and are not present, make it clear that this Pokemon adventure was truly designed for the Game Boy. Making a remake has unintended side effects that are difficult to correct. For example, the graphics are simpler in Pokemon Red and Blue, but they make interactable elements more visible. In Fire Red and Leaf Green, these elements can be mistaken for background decoration, such as the research reports in the mansion telling Mewtwo's story. These stood out much more on the Game Boy. Additionally, signs in front of the gyms are very discreet throughout the adventure. Coupled with the larger world, this disrupts the level design of Red and Blue, which naturally guided the player without them realizing it, fostering curiosity and rewarding exploration. There's also a significant visual change that struck the cities, their color. In Pokemon Red and Blue, each city has a name derived from a color and its own corresponding color, as described on the city signs. Each color has symbolic significance. For example, Pewter City is gray like rocks. Vermilion City is orange like the sun reflecting in the ocean. Lavender Town is purple, symbolizing nobility with its graveyard. Celadon City is green, symbolizing luck, referring to the casino. Saffron City is golden, representing the color associated with currency as it's the city of commerce. Cinnabar Island is red like fire as it's built near a volcano. And the Indigo Plateau, where the final battle takes place, with indigo being a color associated with power. It's this level of detail that has lost its meaning now because these colors are much more discreet and can only be seen on some building. There are also changes borrowed from Ruby and Sapphire that are not good ideas in this context, like the map, for example. Since Ruby and Sapphire, you can move the cursor anywhere on the map, whereas before, you press directions to go from one place to another. It seems like an evolution, but in reality, it possesses a big problem, or rather, removes one of the great qualities of red and blue. The map showed the player the game's progression. If you opened it and pressed up, it would always show you the next place to visit, subtly guiding you because Kanto's route is very winding with detours. For example, after Vermilion City, you have to go back near Cerulean City to take the tunnel and continue towards Lavender Town. If you're a bit lost, you just have to stand in Vermilion City, press up, and it will tell you where to go next. With this new map system designed for Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, we lose this significant advantage of the map, which is a shame because the game was built for it. That's why there are maps in every house in Kanto, and it's optional to get one from Blue's sister. 
In Ruby and Sapphire, it's provided automatically with the PokéNav. Another somewhat involuntary change from the transition to the Game Boy Advance is that the primary graphics of the Game Boy had a huge advantage that would never be replicated afterward. They greatly stimulated the imagination, and I'm convinced that this was one of the big strengths that made the game explode upon its release on the Game Boy. Every player imagined the environments, characters, Pokémon and their attacks and battles. Pokémon Red and Blue on the Game Boy suggested things rather than showing them. Even though Game Freak understood this and tried to retain it as much as possible, it works much less effectively on a Game Boy Advance. The world is much more detailed. Pokémon sprites are more detailed, characters are more detailed, reducing the role of imagination in the game. Therefore, the world is less personal and players are less attached because it's no longer their imagined world, but a world that already exists. And the same thing applies to the music, which was composed for the Game Boy and only touched up in the remake. In my opinion, it's significantly inferior because it becomes more subtle and plain than the originally distinctive and popular music that was widely applauded. Let me play a comparison of some tracks, and you'll see how striking it is. For example, listen to the difference in the music for Vermilion City. It seems calmer and less lively. The same goes for the one for the SS Anne. But it's even more noticeable in completely epic tracks from the Game Boy, like the Gym Leader battle music, which becomes much less epic, even though it's not bad. It's also more noticeable in specific tracks, like the famous Lavender Town theme. which now feels less ominous and doesn't quite fit in the city's atmosphere. While some specific tracks suit the remakes better, like the surf or bicycle themes, overall, the music is adequate, but so far below what the original music offered. You can really feel that the music was composed specifically for the Game Boy, and that it doesn't quite match the sound changes of the Game Boy Advance. However, they were somewhat stuck. They couldn't completely recompose the music as it would remove a significant part of the nostalgia that was part of their goals. Beyond just reusing the music from Red and Blue, they could have corrected some that I always found strange. For example, Saffron City has the same music as Pewter City, and Pewter City could have had its own music. But more importantly, it's always struck me as odd to have such calm and gentle music in Saffron City when Team Rocket has publicly taken over the Sylphco, and block the entire city. It might have been smarter, even if reusing music, to take Team Rocket's theme for the city as long as Team Rocket is present. The music of Team Rocket is, however, reused in the Cerulean Cave, where Mewtwo is found in the post-game, even though Team Rocket has disappeared. Yes, Mewtwo is a creation of Team Rocket, but the entire Cerulean Cave doesn't really represent Team Rocket, and it doesn't fit the atmosphere of the place. Fortunately, we won't have to listen to it for very long because the Cerulean Cave has been greatly simplified, and we reach Mewtwo in a matter of seconds. But what really convinced me that the game's music didn't get the attention it deserved is that the new locations introduced by this game, which we'll talk about a bit later, reuse music already heard. Island 1, 2, and 3 also reuse the music from Pewter City, Cerulean City, and Saffron City. That's a lot of locations with the same music for a Game Boy Advance game especially compared to Ruby and Sapphire released before. 
but it's even worse, some tracks have nothing to do with the game, like tracks from Pokemon Gold and Silver used on Islands 4, 5, 6, and 7. I don't understand what they're doing in the game. Game Freak had already experimented with the music of Gold and Silver while developing Ruby and Sapphire to test the sound capabilities of the console, and they might have reused them to save time. Still, it's a shame not to have original music that better suits these islands, instead of having the music from Violet City on completely different locations. It's more understandable to have reused the iconic music from Gold and Silver for the Naval Rock, which leads to Ho-Oh and Lugia. Still, even here, strangely, the music changes in the building to the basic cave music, unfortunately. It's really a shame that the musical work of the game wasn't pushed further, and this is also true for the sound effects, which lack as much punch as the music, unfortunately. But fortunately, despite these flaws, where Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green shines is in all the additional content it adds to the game, leading to a much more comprehensive adventure. Of course, the significant addition is the Sevi Islands quest. After completing the seventh gym, we're guided by Bill to the Sevi Islands. It's a fantastic idea to include more content here because the latter part of Red and Blue progresses rapidly between the Cinnabar Island gym and the final gym. This addition introduces new places to explore, new Pokemon to encounter, new trainers to battle. Moreover, the incorporation is cleverly done. Leo takes us to the islands to assist Cecilio in connecting the Pokemon storage system to Kanto. As a result, PCs are offline and there's no available Pokemart, making us feel isolated from the rest of the world. It's a great sensation considering it wasn't part of the original adventure and comes at a point when we were riding high on victories feeling invincible. However, as always, adding something to the middle of an adventure not initially designed for it comes with drawbacks. Firstly, the Pokémon encountered on the first three islands are ones we've already seen, both in the wild and with trainers. Coughing, Grimer, Weepinbell, Staryu. Some are even repeated with trainers having the same Pokémon. Once this part is done, the reward is meager, a mere moonstone. Understandably, as this part wasn't in the original game, providing substantial rewards to the player is challenging. Additionally, something that breaks the immersion for me is the names of the islands. They are simply designated by numbers, Island 1, Island 2, and Island 3. It's not very imaginative, especially considering they are mentioned frequently in the dialogues, and there's even an NPC in the game who seems to mock this fact. Giving them real names, especially since each island has distinct environments, would have been more engaging. Perhaps the most significant drawback of adding this segment is the disruption of the game's progression. Recall that I explained Pokemon Red and Blue is constructed in two parts. The first part is linear, leading from one town to another with only one available path. However, upon reaching Lavender Town, the structure becomes more open. You gain access to Saffron City, and there are two different routes to Celadon City. Similar options for reaching Cinnabar Island, and the ability to tackle some cities or gyms out of order. For instance, the attack on the Sylphco building by Team Rocket can occur immediately after the Rocket Game Corner or after Cinnabar Island, and even at the very end. So if you complete Cinnabar Island and its gym before the events in Saffron City, you need to tackle them after returning from the Sevi Islands edition. This means you're stronger than expected, potentially making it easier to defeat Team Rocket and face Sabrina's gym. It's the downside of having a more open structure and trying to add content to it. Nonetheless, this addition is well worth these minor inconveniences, especially considering that Sabrina's Gym is probably the most challenging, as Psychic-type Pokémon are one of the best types in this game. And these Sevi Islands will be revisited in the post-game, after defeating the Elite Four, because it's one of the biggest improvements, in my opinion, of this remake, adding a lot of content after the Pokémon League. Unlike Pokémon Red and Blue, which had little to offer post-league, except the Cerulean Cave and Catching Pokémon, Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green mark the introduction of one of the best items in Pokémon history, the VS Seeker. This item allows players to rematch trainers. This excellent idea, which started to appear in previous games, is now more widespread, with a significant number of trainers responding to rematches by having stronger Pokémon. Trainers who initially had basic Pokémon at level 19 now have evolved Pokémon at level 51. This system provides an excellent means to train Pokémon, complete the Pokédex more easily, earn money, and make the Pokémon world feel more alive as trainers improve and are not just NPCs defeated once and forgotten. 
The VS Seeker is particularly useful on the Sevi Islands because, after the League, new islands can be unlocked. But you need to get the national decks to unlock all the islands, and to get it, you need to catch 60 different Pokémon in the Pokédex. This is a great idea as it encourages players to explore areas they haven't visited yet, such as the optional power plant, the Safari Zone with its many available Pokémon, and the Seafoam Islands. Additionally, Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green introduce new assistants who encourage and accompany players in their Pokémon catching journey, offering rewards for every 10 Pokémon registered in the Pokédex. After registering 60 Pokémon and obtaining the National Pokédex, players find Bill on Island 1, who asks them to find a Ruby. Here's where things get really strange. Team Rocket reappears once again. Players must first chase them from Mount Ember, then from Island 4, then go to Island 5, proceed to Island 6 and the Ruin Valley, and finally return to Island 5 to dismantle Team Rocket at its source. This feels odd because during the main adventure, players have already disbanded Team Rocket. Their grunts disappear from Celadon City, Saffron City, and even Giovanni vanishes after being defeated in the final gym. Reintroducing Team Rocket on the Sevi Islands feels a bit forced, especially considering the dialogue where the new admin says verbatim, I obey Giovanni even though Giovanni is no longer present. It's explained that they want to reform Team Rocket from there, connecting the story to Pokémon Gold and Silver. Nevertheless, it doesn't hinder the experience much because there's no rush. Players can explore the islands along the way, and it serves more as an incentive to visit new locations. Overall, the post-game content is exceptional, with well-designed Sevi Islands featuring memorable locations. On Island 4, there's a daycare where players can breed Pokémon, which wasn't possible in the original games. This becomes useful for obtaining Pokémon that evolve only through breeding, such as baby Pokémon like Magby and Elekid. What's even more exciting is learning that Lorelei, a member of the Elite Four, is originally from Island 4, and the island contains an ice cave with ice puzzles, ice-type Pokémon, and Lorelei coming to help defeat Team Rocket by battling two members simultaneously. It's a great idea to provide more background for such characters, revealing their origins and incorporating them into new areas. Then we arrive at Island 5 with its meadow, a vacation camp with many trainers, a water maze where we receive a Togepi, a memorial erected by a trainer for his onyx, and most notably, a strange cave to the north, the Lost Cave. In this cave, taking the wrong direction leads back to the beginning. The number of rocks in each room indicates the direction, and at the very end, we find Selfie, who gives us rare items if we present her with the requested Pokémon. This adds an element of puzzle-solving and exploration to the combat and challenges against other trainers, creating a well-balanced and complementary experience in the Sevi Islands. It showcases a different facet of the game, deviating from the linear structure of the original Pokémon Red and Blue adventure. Next, we head to Island 6, following a similar pattern but with different locations. A canal, a green path, and a large grassy field with numerous trainers and Pokémon. There is also the Ruin Valley and the Dotted Hole, a mysterious closed cave with braille inscriptions to decode using the manual provided with the game, similar to the Reggie quest in Pokémon Ruby and Sapphire. The text instructs the use of Cut to open the door. Inside, there's a labyrinth with braille instructions leading to a Sapphire, which is later stolen by Team Rocket. Finally, there's the last island with a canyon leading to the Tanabi Key, a small cave with a rock puzzle, and a bit further, the chambers, small empty caves. By solving the Tanabi key puzzle, the appearance of unknown is unlocked in the chambers, with two new forms of unknown, the question mark and exclamation point forms, exclusive to this area. These quests and exploration of the Sevi Islands are excellent, well-paced, highly engaging, and with the islands featuring Pokémon from the second generation. These Pokémon come with new sprites, moves, and are well distributed in the wild and among the trainers, constantly providing a sense of novelty, a desire to explore, and a natural way to complete the Pokédex during the exploration. This is a huge strength of the game, complementing the overall gaming experience and bridging the gap between the vision of Pokémon Red and Blue and that of Ruby and Sapphire, with the introduction of secondary puzzles and explorations inspired by the latter. And that's not the only thing to do after beating the Elite Four, as obtaining the National Pokédex allows access to the most dangerous place in the game, Cerulean Cave, which houses incredibly strong and high-level Pokémon, including useful Pokémon like Ditto for breeding, culminating in the iconic encounter with the monstrous Mewtwo. 
However, the Cerulean Cave is somewhat disappointing because it's simpler, shorter, and less dangerous than the one in Pokemon Red and Blue. Furthermore, there are far fewer different Pokemon than in the original, where it was a vast, rewarding area for players. Pokemon like Raichu, Wigglytuff, Dodrio, Arbok, Sandslash, Hypno, and Marowak are no longer present. Additionally, there's no longer the opportunity to find Chansey here. It's exclusively available in the Safari Zone. Unfortunately, the Safari Zone in this version is exceptionally challenging. It's difficult even to catch basic Pokemon, making encountering Chansey with a mere 1% chance of appearing and then successfully catching it a miraculous feat. On the flip side, there's a rare chance that Chansey may be holding a lucky egg, an incredibly powerful item that boosts the experience gained in battles. Even more challenging are the exclusive legendary Pokémon, Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. Depending on the player's chosen starter Pokémon, one of these legendary beasts will be available at level 50 after finishing the league. However, they have a significant problem. If encountered, and they use Roar, a bug in the game prevents them from being encountered again. Normally, they would just change routes, but due to this bug, Players would need to restart the game or hope for another chance encounter. Given how challenging they were to obtain for years, this bug is really troublesome and should have been corrected at least for international releases, because in Japan at least, they did a lot of events where they gave away these Pokémon. These legendaries, along with Mewtwo, will be very useful for the rematches with the Pokémon League. For the first time in Pokémon, it's possible to challenge again the Elite Four. They have become much stronger with new Pokémon integrated into the teams, reaching up to level 75. This includes formidable Pokémon like Aldo evolving his Onix into Steelix, Agatha replacing her Ghastly with Misdrevious and evolving her Golbat into Crobat, and Peter having two Dragonite and a Kingdra, all at high levels. Blue now has a Scizor and a Tyranitar, both at level 72. It's incredible to experience high-level battles with excellent AI. While the dialogue lines remain unchanged, the brilliant idea of having higher-level rematches compensates for this small inconvenience. This will be very useful for battles because, unlike Ruby and Sapphire, which introduced the Battle Tower from Pokémon Crystal, it is absent here. Instead, Game Freak added what they called a Trainer Tower, a tower with eight floors where players engage in battles. The goal is not just to defeat the opposing trainers, but to do so as quickly as possible, forcing players to take risks in battles and fight differently. The tower offers four battle styles, single, one Pokémon versus one, double, two Pokémon versus two, knockout, attacked by three trainers instead of one on each floor, and mixed, a mix of the previous three. The opponent Pokémon are at the level of the player's strongest Pokémon and no experience is gained here, making battles challenging. It's an interesting idea that differs from the Battle Tower in Ruby and Sapphire, but the problem is that the rewards are negligible and don't make sense. While the goal is supposedly to finish as quickly as possible, the rewards don't depend on speed, and they lack any real significance. Players receive an upgrade for finishing in single mode and a dragon scale for finishing in double mode, both of which can already be found in the game upgrade in the Team Rocket Warehouse, and Dragon Scale on Island 6. These items are needed only once to evolve Porygon and Seedra, respectively. Thus, these rewards serve literally no purpose, making it unappealing to engage in the other categories. It's truly unfortunate to have implemented all this and, in the end, not encourage players to utilize it. However, that's the difficult Trainer Tower, which can be enhanced using cards through the e-reader, an accessory that scans cards to retrieve data. And some of these cards change the trainers in the trainer tower with original teams. However, since the accessory wasn't successful outside of Japan and was not even in Europe, some of these trainers are included by default in the international version of the trainer tower. A great idea, but unfortunately, this is not the case for other content enabled by the e-reader. In the Japanese version with the accessory, it was possible to face special trainers scanned via cards, and some even had shiny Pokémon in their teams. There were trainers to battle in the back room of a house on the Sevi Islands, and this room was entirely locked out for players outside of Japan. The e-reader also allowed players to obtain special events through cards distributed at events or in magazines. 
These events included obtaining the Mystic Ticket and the Aurora Ticket, granting access to Islands 8 and 9, respectively. These islands housed the Naval Rock. Players could face Lugia and Ho'o, and the Birth Island, which after a small puzzle allowed players to battle the extremely rare Deoxys. Deoxys's form changed depending on the version, attack form in Fire Red and defense form in Leaf Green. However, since the e-reader was never released in Europe and nobody bought it in the US, players had access to far fewer events. Nintendo did organize some events outside of the e-reader, but again, there were very few outside of Japan, making them nearly inaccessible for many players. And it gets even worse. The Altering Cave is a cave at the end of Island 6 where only low-level Zubats appear. The cave is tiny, and that's all there is to it. For a long time, players didn't understand why Game Freak had included this cave. The truth is, this cave was coded to host events that would replace the Zubats with Pokémon not found anywhere else in the game. However, these events were never triggered and strangely never released. Even more bizarre is that they imported the same cave into Pokémon Emerald, released later with the same implementation, but again, the events were never triggered. This means that in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, it's impossible to complete the National Pokédex only with the main series games. Pokémon Emerald, which has these missing Pokémon, was released a year later. The only way to obtain these Pokémon and complete the National Pokédex is to have Pokémon Colosseum, catch the missing Pokémon there, and transfer them to Pokémon Fire Red. This is ridiculous. To finish Pokémon Fire Red, you need to trade the Pokémon Leaf Green, Pokémon Ruby, Pokémon Sapphire, which are on the same console, but also have the GameCube, the cable to connect the Game Boy Advance to the GameCube, Pokémon Colosseum, and transfer the Pokémon. It's overly convoluted and tedious. While it's commendable for the game to offer trades with Pokémon Colosseum and Pokémon XD, forcing players to have everything to complete the Pokédex is a shame because many quickly become discouraged, knowing it's nearly impossible to finish it. Even if, by some miracle, you complete the National Pokédex, there's not much of a reward, just a diploma, which is quite meager. A diploma was fine in the days of Red and Blue because it was easy to complete. There were only 150 Pokémon and only two games. Here, it's much more complex and, in my opinion, deserve a better reward. What makes this process easier is the wireless adapter provided with the game, making trades much simpler. Additionally, there is the Union Room, where up to five players can connect simultaneously, send messages, or engage in two versus two battles with up to four players. It's a fantastic addition to the game, included by default, making it much easier for players to connect. And there is also a house on Island 2 where you can play two minigames in multiplayer. A jump rope minigame where you jump over the vines of a Venusaur, and another where three players, each with the wireless adapter, need to have a Dodrio in their team to play and pick berries falling from trees. Apparently, Game Freak valued this feature a lot because to complete the trainer card, you need to succeed in 200 jumps and catch 200 berries to get a star, with other requirements being beating the Elite Four, completing the regional Pokedex, and the National Pokédex to get a gold trainer card, ultimately finishing the game 100%. The third generation corrected many bugs present in Pokémon Red and Blue, including those that allowed players to encounter all Pokémon. This is a good thing because there were numerous bugs in Red and Blue, such as the text indicating the effectiveness of an attack being bugged, and considering only the opponent's first type, potentially misleading players. However, some bugs were fantastic, like the Cinnabar Island glitch that allowed players to encounter Pokémon from the last area visited. It also allowed access to the famous Glitch City, the Walk Through Walls glitch, and of course, the famous Missing No, the Glitch Pokémon. Unintentionally, developers provided players with much more than they initially intended in the original games, significantly contributing to the success of the games by allowing players to push the boundaries further. Although there are still some bugs in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, they don't carry the same importance or charm. And for many players, this is something these games lack, even if it's not necessarily something to blame them for. In the end, even though the third generation has fewer bugs and they are more complicated to exploit, some things it brought about contributed to the birth of other aspects of the game. This includes Pokémon battling with what is called Pokémon Strategy, which began to take shape around websites like Smogon. Players engaged in battles on cartridges or simulators, exploiting the immense depth offered by the Pokémon battle system in the third generation. 
This included various abilities, IVs and EVs, new items like the Choice Band that boosts attack by 50% but locks you into using one move, or special berries, and new moves like Calm Mind or Will-O-Wisp. Then there is breeding, allowing players to pass on special moves from parent Pokémon to their offspring through eggs. There were so many possibilities, and with the adoption of the internet, a real community became passionate about these battles. It structured itself with different tiers and ban lists to create an environment conducive to Pokémon battles and push them further than what the main series games had to offer, and it has persisted till this today. There's also Shiny Hunting, which really took off in the third generation with many guides, players exchanging screenshots, and most importantly at that time, almost no Pokémon were Shiny locked. Players could obtain Shiny Pokémon, even legendary and mythical Pokémon like Deoxys, through events. Many players started saving in front of stationary Pokémon, like legendaries, initiating the battle to see if it was Shiny or not, and restarting the game to try again repeating this process for dozens and dozens of hours until finally getting the shiny Pokémon they wanted. This annoyed Game Freak quite a bit because shiny Pokémon were not created with this mindset. As a result, many legendary or mythical Pokémon in later games were made shiny locked. But we'll have time to talk about that when we cover more recent games. Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green were originally intended to save time for Game Freak by reusing the engine from Ruby and Sapphire for the very first adventure in the franchise. It becomes a peculiar remake due to its changes, ultimately providing a gameplay experience quite different from Pokémon Red and Blue. The progression is significantly smoother with the addition of running shoes, some gym leaders becoming easier to defeat, caves being much faster but losing some of their appeal, and the game world becoming livelier with added and more mobile NPCs. Dialogues are more detailed, providing background for certain characters, and the overall presentation is more elaborate, especially when taking care of our Pokémon. The battles also underwent significant improvements with a more refined and natural AI, deeper combat mechanics with the additions of the third generation, and a greater variety of usable Pokémon. Despite some regrettable steps backward, such as music losing some of its charm and, paradoxically, gyms becoming less deep and too simplistic, the additions brought by the game, such as more detailed graphics, streamlined ergonomics, the inclusion of a new portion between the Cinnabar Island and the end of the game, and a very rich post-gaming, diverse environments, puzzles, battles, and more, end up justifying the remake of a seemingly unnecessary game, considering that Game Boy games can be played on the Game Boy Advance. Additions like the VS Seeker, the National Pokédex, Move Tutors, and the ability to rematch against the Elite Four are so significant that they will almost all be retained in subsequent games, becoming standards in the series for a long time, all brought by a remake. Although it could have gone further, better thought out some changes, or been even more comprehensive, what Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green bring is sufficiency complete and innovative to justify their existence, despite releasing just five short years after the original game in the US and Europe. The fact that it was released at the price of a standard Game Boy Advance game while including a new accessory is proof of great honesty on Nintendo's part, and the wireless adapter, which may seem trivial today, played a crucial role in Nintendo's history. According to Satoru Okada, an engineer involved in the design of the Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, and Nintendo DS, it was through the design of this accessory that Nintendo got the idea to integrate wireless connectivity directly into the Nintendo DS allowing multiplayer gaming without any additional accessory in a very straightforward manner. Whether for the Pokémon series or even for the subsequent consoles, Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green have left a substantial legacy. This is highly commendable for a remake and has paved the way for a new branch of the Pokémon saga, with remakes releasing approximately every six years, some of which have forever marked the history of the franchise like Pokémon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, still considered widely as one of the best games in the series. We will have time to discuss all of that in a future video. Thank you so much for accompanying me on this long and perilous journey into the depths of Kanto. I had immense pleasure making this video, even though it was a tremendous amount of work. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If so, don't hesitate to like the video and subscribe. We'll meet again soon for a new video. See you!